Hey guys, today I'll show you a mystery horror TV series named Another. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The story took place on April 25, 1998, a middle schooler named Koichi moving to Yomiyama due to his father's job transfer to India. Unfortunately, he was hospitalized for a collapsed lung shortly after arriving. Thankfully, his grandmother and aunt came to visit him. His grandmother even lamented that his father was too honest, not getting remarried even after his wife had been dead for so long. Simultaneously, his aunt, named Mikami, pointed out the window to the middle school Koichi would attend, and it turns out that his aunt was currently an assistant teacher in the same school. She told him that although there would be differences between public and private middle schools, he would adapt quickly. The next day, three classmates carrying flowers came to visit Koichi. They were from class three of the third year in Yomiyama Middle School, Kazami, Sakura, and Izumi. They had been sent here to greet the new transfer student on behalf of the class. However, the three of them were curious, asking Koichi if he had lived in Yomiyama for a long time. Seeing his confusion, the trio couldn't get a satisfactory answer. Then, Kazami handed Koichi an envelope containing photocopies of study notes. Koichi felt truly grateful for that. But then, Kazami seemed to want to say something but held back. Before he could, Izumi reached out to shake hands with Koichi, and once again asked him if he had previously lived in Yomiyama. In the evening, Koichi picked up his phone and decided to go downstairs in search of a snack. However, upon entering the elevator, it started moving without him pressing any buttons. He then noticed another student in the elevator, a girl also wearing the uniform of Yomiyama Middle School. Her destination was the hospital's basement level 2. Without much thought, Koichi asked her why she was going to the hospital's basement so late. The girl coldly replied that she had to deliver something. They soon reached the basement, and the girl walked out alone into the darkness. Koichi quickly followed, asking for her name. From the dark, her voice echoed back, telling him her name was Misaki. Koichi was taken aback. He looked up and saw the sign indicating it's the morgue. On May 6, 1998, it was Koichi's official first day of school. Early that morning, his father, who was far away in India, called to check on his illness symptoms and to encourage him to be energetic, like a man should be. He also asked Koichi to say hello to his grandparents on his behalf. Later, his aunt gave him some advice about attending a public school at Yomiyama. She emphasized the importance of respecting the class rules and pointed out that unlike private schools in Tokyo, team honor is far more important than individual honor here. Koichi promised to keep that in mind. At school, the teacher advised Koichi to establish a good relationship with his classmates and assured him that he could ask for help if needed. Standing on the platform, Koichi introduced himself to the class. However, the classmates were strangely indifferent. Even though the teacher warmly welcomed him, they showed no extra expressions or actions. Everyone seemed gloomy. Koichi noticed among the students the girl he had met previously in the hospital elevator going to the basement. After class, a few students approached Koichi, asking about his health and the differences between schools in Tokyo and Yomiyama. The conversation buzzed with their numerous questions. They also learned from the teacher that Koichi's father was a university professor and asked where he had gone for his research trip. After answering all their questions, Koichi curiously asked why he hadn't seen Izumi, one of the students who visited him in the hospital. Kazami quickly explained that she was probably out sick. After saying this, he gave a subtle signal to a classmate nearby, who immediately took the hint and changed the topic, offering to show Koichi around the campus to help him familiarize himself with the environment. During gym class, all the students ran freely, drenched in sweat. Koichi, however, due to his lung illness, could only watch with envy. At that moment, a classmate, Takaba, struck up a conversation with him. Takaba, too, couldn't run due to a heart condition and was envious of his fellow students who could. Koichi comforted him not to worry, assuring him that one day he'd be able to run as well. Takaba seemed a bit uncomfortable. He stood up, excused himself to Koichi, stating he needed to rest in the infirmary, and declined Koichi's offer to accompany him. Just as Takaba left, Sakura, a classmate who had sprained her ankle the day before, sat down next to Koichi and said something quite perplexing. Without giving it much thought, Koichi asked her why he hadn't seen Misaki. However, he didn't notice Sakura's pupils suddenly constricted. As he finished speaking, a soft rumble of thunder echoed from the sky. Koichi looked up to see Misaki on the school rooftop. Without a second thought, he rushed up to the rooftop where Misaki was sketching in her notebook. 
In response to Koichi's concerned inquiry, she quickly hid her sketchbook behind her. Misaki tucked her wind-blown hair. Seemingly perplexed, she asked if the classmates had said anything to him. Before Koichi could answer, she went on to say that Koichi's name made people think of death. Not just ordinary death, but a cruel and inexplicable death set in the school. In Yomiyama, the class closest to death was class three of the third year. Finally, Misaki warned Koichi to keep his distance from her, suggesting it was best not to approach or converse with her. Koichi was left baffled by her words, but Misaki mysteriously implied that he would understand in due time. The next day, Koichi sought out Misaki once again. Misaki was puzzled as to why he kept coming to see her. She advised Koichi to be careful. Perhaps things had already begun. During art class, a classmate named Yuya created a painting titled The Scream of the Lemon. He explained that this was how he envisioned lemons. Their assistant teacher, Mikami, reluctantly let him continue his artwork, but insisted it not leave the art room. Out of curiosity, Koichi asked about the meaning of Yuya's painting. He explained that the world was screaming and the lemon was just trying to cover its ears. He then invited Koichi to join the art club. After looking around the room, Koichi declined Yuya's offer but noticed that Misaki was once again absent. After class, Koichi and Yuya discussed the painting The Scream. Yuya expressed that it represented the author's anxiety towards the world. At that moment, a student named Naoya came from behind and invited Koichi to join the art club. Koichi asked him if there was anything he was afraid of. Naoya responded without hesitation that he never imagined he would end up in the cursed class three upon reaching the third year. Upon hearing this, all three of them were stunned. Naoya told Koichi he wanted to tell him this yesterday, but Yuya stopped him at that time, fearing that continuing might lead to something bad happening. Suddenly, Koichi spotted Misaki in the classroom. He walked straight over to her, ignoring the attempts of Naoya and Yuya to stop him. Koichi complimented Misaki's excellent drawing skills. To his surprise, Misaki was not as cold as before and told Koichi she wanted to add wings to the drawing. Koichi inquired about Misaki's eyes, noticing she was constantly wearing an eye patch. Misaki asked Koichi if he really wanted to know. Thinking Misaki may have misunderstood, Koichi clarified that she didn't have to share if she didn't want to. With a laugh, Misaki decided not to tell him. Before Koichi could respond, the librarian appeared. Even though it was their first meeting, he didn't hesitate to shoo Koichi away, insisting he should hurry to class. Upon arriving home after the class, the aunt asked Koichi about his day at school. She informed him that the librarian he met today was a man always dressed in black who seemed unapproachable. She then asked Koichi if he had decided on what club to join. Koichi replied he hadn't decided yet, expressing little interest in painting. However, he was quite keen on applying to an art school to learn sculpting or modeling, if possible. The aunt cautioned that his father might object, considering the potential difficulties in finding a job later. But she encouraged him to pursue what he wanted to do. Late at night, Koichi visited the hospital to see Nurse Mizuno. He asked her if a girl had passed away during his previous hospital stay. Mizuno was somewhat puzzled as no one had died in her ward, but she promised to inquire for him. She did request, however, that Koichi explain why he wanted to know. After their conversation, Mizuno affectionately referred to him as Scare Boy. As Koichi left, the elevator doors closed, cutting off the last glimmer of light. The next day in class, Koichi was somewhat distracted. He glanced towards the corner of the classroom at Misaki's empty seat. When he turned back around, he was surprised to see Izumi observing him. After class, Izumi and Sakura approached Koichi, probing into his background. They asked if he was born in Yomiyama, whether he went straight to Tokyo after his birth, and if he had ever returned since. After getting the answers she wanted, Izumi breathed a sigh of relief. She assured Koichi that she didn't mean to target him. As a member of the countermeasures group of the class, she was responsible for everyone's safety. Koichi was even more confused, wondering what this countermeasures group was. As Izumi was about to explain the rules of Class 3, Sakura and Yuya pulled her aside for a whispered conversation. Izumi became visibly angered after their discussion. At that moment, Koichi saw Misaki leaving school and immediately excused himself to follow her, oblivious to the frustrated Izumi behind him. Koichi followed Misaki out of the school gate, walking further away, oblivious to the cawing crows overhead and the increasingly remote path. Then, suddenly, Misaki turned a corner and disappeared. Despite Koichi's best efforts, he couldn't find her anywhere. As he turned around, he noticed a doll in a shop window. Just then, his phone rang. It was Nurse Mizuno. She informed Koichi that she had found out about the girl he was asking about. Apparently, she was still in middle school and the only child in her family. Her parents were devastated by her loss. 
Her name sounded like Misaki. After ending the call, Koichi swallowed hard and entered the doll shop. The shop was manned by an old woman. When Koichi asked if the items were dolls, she said they were, sort of, and offered him a student discount. Koichi looked around at the dolls in the shop. All of them had an indescribable eeriness about them. As he wandered around, he found himself in a dimly lit basement filled with disassembled doll parts. Suddenly in a corner, he saw a doll that looked exactly like Misaki. A chill ran up his spine. Koichi was confused. Why was such a thing here? He was then shocked by a voice. It's Misaki who emerged from the corner, assuring him that she hadn't intentionally hidden to scare him. Misaki toyed with the doll's hair and told Koichi that it indeed resembled her, but it was only half complete. Koichi, curious about why Misaki was here, received a cold reply. She was there simply because she liked it. Misaki then offered to show him what's under her eye patch, and to Koichi's surprise, she had only one eye and used a doll's eye as a prosthetic. She said this prosthetic eye could see something supernatural, which is why she usually covers it up. Despite being somewhat shocked, Koichi didn't overthink or fear anything after learning Misaki's secret. Instead, he started chatting with her. When Koichi asked Misaki about the first time he saw her, she was also holding a doll. Was it a gift for someone? After confirming it, Koichi asked Misaki if she had any siblings. But as soon as the question left his mouth, he became anxious. Nurse Mizuno had told him that the deceased girl was an only child, which left her parents heartbroken. Suddenly feeling nervous, Koichi recalled the shopkeeper's words when he entered the doll shop. There were no other customers at this hour. Seeing Koichi's unease, Misaki calmly told him to ask whatever he wanted to ask. Then she added she warned him not to get close to her, but he didn't do as told, and now it might be too late. Koichi asked why. Misaki stood up, moved closer to him, and began to tell him a story. 26 years ago, an incident occurred in Class 3. At that time, there was a student in the class who excelled in sports and studies. She was friendly towards her classmates and teachers, and therefore everyone liked her. However, not long after she advanced to the third year, she died without clear reasons. Some said that it was related to a plane crash while her family was on a trip, but it was also rumored that her death was related to traffic accidents or even a fire at home. The classmates were devastated and sad, but then suddenly someone said she didn't die and pointed to her used desk with certainty. Then, more and more people started saying the same thing, spreading throughout the entire class like a chain reaction. Nobody wanted to believe such a harsh reality. Gradually, the class pretended as though she was still alive. Eventually, even the homeroom teacher also followed suit. Even at the final graduation ceremony, due to the principal's arrangement, a seat was specially arranged for this student. After the graduation ceremony, everyone took a graduation photo in the classroom. But when the finished photo was developed, the supposedly dead student was found standing silently in the corner, her face a pale white color like a deceased person, smiling quietly just like everyone else. Surprisingly, the deceased student's name was also Misaki. The air seemed to freeze, causing Koichi to shrank. At this moment, a phone ring interrupted Misaki. Koichi answered the call. It was his grandmother, worrying about why he hadn't returned home so long after school. He explained that he would rush home, then hung up. But at this moment, Misaki said that she found devices quite annoying. No matter where you were, you could be connected and found by others. At this moment, the elderly shopkeeper reminded Koichi that it was already dark and it was time to close the shop. She suggested he go home for the day. Koichi was taken aback. When he looked back again, Misaki had vanished into thin air right before him, without traces of her smell. The day after school, a misty drizzle began to fall from the sky. Koichi, without an umbrella, could only stand by the window, waiting and hoping for the rain to pass quickly. Just then, Sakura came over and invited him to walk home together. She had brought an umbrella, and her home was also in the same direction as Koichi's. Along the way, they discussed their recent school trip. Sakura cheerfully told Koichi about her visit to Tokyo. All in all, she had created many joyful memories. Just as Koichi was about to change shoes and leave school, he suddenly remembered Misaki. He asked Sakura about her without much thought. To his surprise, upon hearing Misaki's name, Sakura's breathing became rapid. She told Koichi that one should not mention this name in Class 3. Just as Koichi was still puzzled, Naoya also walked over. Koichi, not wanting to be left in the dark, asked Naoya about the student who had died in Class 3 many years ago. At this moment, teacher Mikami came over. Upon learning that Koichi was asking about the legend, she immediately dispersed the three of them, forbidding them from further discussion.
discussion. The next day, Koichi and Yuya were walking in the school. This time, he saw Misaki again, standing on the roof of the school. He ran up to the rooftop to find her, but just then, his phone rang. It was Naoya. As soon as Koichi picked up the call, Naoya's anxious voice came over, telling Koichi to come back immediately and not to associate with non-existent people. Moreover, as long as this month passed, he would tell him all the truth. Koichi was quite surprised and felt a bit confused. In the evening, he received a call from Nurse Mizuno at the hospital. Mizuno told him the dead girl's name. The next day at school, when Koichi met Misaki, he asked about the dead girl. Misaki told him that the girl was her cousin and they had been very close since they were young. Following this, Koichi asked again about the legend of Class 3. Because of all his experiences since transferring schools, he was very concerned about it. But Misaki told him that all of that didn't exist. Suddenly, Koichi remembered that Naoya had once told him over the phone not to interact with things that don't exist, as it would be very bad. Then, surprisingly, Misaki told Koichi yet again that everyone else couldn't see her, only Koichi could. Koichi was scared to wet his pants. He frantically recalled everything that had happened in this period, pondering over the clues he had gathered. Just then, a teacher came running up from the stairs and rushed into the classroom to announce something. Upon hearing it, Sakura emerged from the classroom in a state of panic. Upon seeing Koichi, Sakura became even more alarmed and turned to run in another direction. However, as she was descending the stairs, she suddenly slipped. Losing her balance, she fell forward and her umbrella flew out of her hand. The accident happened so suddenly. In the blink of an eye, the tip of the umbrella pierced Sakura's throat and blood spurted out instantly. Sakura's hands flailed in the air as if trying to grasp at a last lifeline. Hearing the commotion, Koichi and the teacher rushed over. Koichi was shocked to see such a horrifying scene. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. That very day, Sakura's mother also lost her life in a car accident. Later, Koichi went to the hospital alone to check on his lung. Nurse Mizuno let out a sigh of relief, expressing her gratitude that he had endured after witnessing such a gruesome scene. However, she warned him not to dwell on it too much, and assured him that she would take good care of him if he fell ill and had to be hospitalized again. Fortunately, Koichi's medical examination didn't reveal any major issues. He simply needed to avoid strenuous exercise and wait another month to fully recover. After being discharged from the hospital, Koichi encountered his classmate Ayano on his way home. The two of them chatted about their drama club activities while walking. Suddenly, a strong wind blew, causing a large piece of glass nearby to come crashing down towards them. Koichi reacted quickly and managed to pull Ayano out of the way. Both of them felt a sense of lingering fear. Ayano exclaimed that she wasn't ready to die yet. Later, Koichi visited the doll shop he had been to before. Strangely enough, the old shopkeeper repeated the same words as last time. Koichi found this odd, but didn't think much of it. This time, he went directly to the basement and found the doll that resembled Misaki. Surprisingly, Misaki was also there. Koichi asked her why she wasn't at school and how things were in their class. Misaki revealed that their classmates were terrified, believing that something had already started. Koichi couldn't hold back his curiosity any longer. He wanted to know what was going on. However, Misaki advised him that it was better to know less. Just as Koichi was about to press for more answers, a doll on the shelf fell to the floor. By the time he turned back around, Misaki had disappeared without traces of her smell. On the following day, June 3rd, everyone at school was discussing the death of Sakura. It puzzled everyone why she had taken a detour using the seldom-used staircase. Many students thought that the death curse had been triggered again. However, fellow student Takako analyzed that Sakura's incident might be merely an accident. Otherwise, the series of death events should have started in May. Yet Izumi didn't agree, especially since Sakura's mother also had an unexpected accident. Takako further analyzed whether the transfer of Koichi might have broken the cycle. Izumi thought that this was probably arranged by the principal who didn't know the full story. The reason the teachers didn't explain it to Koichi was that they thought it would be better if such things only circulated among students. The discussion was heated when Koichi entered the classroom. Everyone turned to look at him, then quickly turned away, engrossed in their own affairs. It seemed as if all the students were avoiding him. Left with no choice, Koichi turned to his childhood friend, Naoya, who had promised to tell him the truth about everything when June arrived. However, before Naoya could say anything, Izumi intervened, stating that the situation had changed and it was not suitable to reveal anything to Koichi at the moment. Although frustrated, Koichi couldn't press further. He changed the subject and asked Naoya what he meant by his previous 
statement. Don't interact with things that don't exist. Just then, Koichi's phone rang. It was Nurse Mizuno. She told Koichi that she had tried to inquire about the incidents from 26 years ago and the ones from last week, but those who knew wouldn't speak a word. Furthermore, when she mentioned Misaki, they stated there had never been such a person in the class. Koichi was skeptical and questioned the reliability of her sources. However, Nurse Mizuno seriously explained that it was true. As she was speaking, she entered an elevator in the hospital. Because of poor signal, their conversation was interrupted by harsh static. Suddenly, sparks started to fly from the elevator's wheels. The elevator plummeted and crashed into the ground floor, turning into a pile of wreckage. A slow stream of bright red blood seeped out, reminiscent of a poppy flower, dangerous yet strikingly beautiful. Despite being shocked by the sudden death of Nurse Mizuno, Koichi resumed his classes as usual the next day. The teacher expressed condolences for Nurse Mizuno's death since a student in Class 3 was her younger brother. At that moment, Koichi saw Misaki, who hadn't been in class for a long time. After class, Koichi approached Misaki to ask whether she knew about the incident. He, however, didn't notice the glances from his classmates. During the sketching practice class, Yuya, looking a bit worried, asked Koichi why teacher Mikami isn't here. Koichi comforted him, assuring that Mikami would be fine. Yuya explained that he was just a little worried, considering what had happened to Sakura and then to Nurse Mizuno. After hearing this, Koichi became curious, wondering if these incidents were connected, but he knew Yuya wouldn't tell him anything. So Koichi got up and left the art room. He then headed to the school library and found the school history. The school was established in 1972. Koichi began to leaf through the school history album. A picture of a beautiful girl from class 3 caught his eye. That was his mother. At that moment, the librarian appeared behind him. When Koichi pointed out the person in the picture, the librarian recognized her immediately. Koichi also mentioned that his mother had died 15 years ago after giving birth to him. The librarian seemed to murmur as if recalling something. Just then, the library door was opened by Izumi. She told Koichi that the class teacher wanted to see him in the office. After finishing, she apologized to Koichi in a baffling way, saying it was all for the student's good, then walked away. The teacher didn't actually have anything significant for Koichi. The police needed to come investigate and take a statement. They asked whether he was on the phone with Nurse Mizuno at the time of the incident. They then told him that it was just an accident. Due to the hospital's aging equipment, the rope broke, leading to Nurse Mizuno's tragedy. After Koichi was finished being questioned, he returned to the classroom only to find it empty. However, everyone's belongings were still there. On the blackboard was something resembling a vote with Izumi's name written on it. Just then, the teacher passed by the classroom door and called out to him, telling him he could go home for the day. Koichi curiously asked the teacher where everyone in the class had gone, but the teacher didn't answer. Instead, he was told that the class had elected a new class president, Izumi. The teacher then urged Koichi to go home quickly and left. But Koichi, still perplexed, walked over to Misaki's desk. All the desks in the classroom were brand new, except for Misaki's, which was marked with the patina of time. After school, Koichi waited to walk home with Yuya and Takaba. However, they felt awkward when they saw him. Koichi asked again where everyone had gone during the last class. Yuya told him that everyone had gone to a meeting, and that from now on, some things he wouldn't like would occur. But he asked Koichi to bear with it for everyone's sake. Koichi was filled with questions, especially since Izumi had said something similar before. However, he didn't press for more details. Instead, he asked Yuya for a copy of the class register. Takaba stepped forward. He felt it was unfair that Izumi had unilaterally pushed her decision onto everyone. He then told Koichi to feel free to ask if he had any questions and that he would answer as best he could. Yuya was shocked by his words and tried to stop him. Koichi then asked if Misaki really existed. Takaba was about to answer, but he suddenly clutched his chest in pain and collapsed. Witnessing this scene, Koichi felt a deep sense of fear. The following day, June 5th, Koichi went to school as usual. He bumped into teacher Mikami at the stairway corner and greeted her, but the teacher acted as if she hadn't seen him and walked away. When Koichi arrived at the classroom, he tried to ask his classmates if anything had happened, but to his surprise, no one paid any attention to him. Then, the class teacher urged everyone to offer prayers for Takaba. Despite the continuous tragedies, they must not lose heart or give up. He also reminded them to observe the class rules. After class, Koichi wanted to ask Yuya what had happened, but he seemed so nervous that he ran away immediately. His other classmates also seemed unwilling to talk to him. Even his best friend Kawara apologized and left in a hurry, as if he didn't want to stay a second longer. Even when Koichi stood up and left the classroom, neither the teacher nor any of the students found it odd. 
At the end of the school day, while packing his bag, Koichi found two notes that had fallen from his desk. After picking them up and reading them, he was immediately shocked. After school, he went to the doll shop to meet Misaki and handed her the two notes. One was a photocopy of the class register, and the other was a note that said, Ask Misaki about this matter. Koichi told Misaki that Takaba had passed away, and that when he went to school that day, the situation had become strange. All the students acted as if he didn't exist. To his surprise, Misaki seemed to take delight in his misfortune and asked how it felt. Koichi explained that it wasn't a pleasant feeling, but he was relieved to know that Misaki really existed. Misaki then took Koichi upstairs, revealing that it was her home and that her mother made these dolls. She offered Koichi a can of Coca-Cola, affirming that she was indeed real, but she only ceased to exist in Class 3. And all this started on May 1st of this year. Koichi was curious as to why they were being treated this way. Misaki explained that after an incident 26 years ago, a series of incidents involving students and their family members dying occurred in this class during unspecified years. The trigger for these incidents was the appearance of an extra person in the class, but no one could identify who the extra person was. At the start of the new term 25 years ago, regardless of how they checked the records, the number of people always seemed correct. However, nobody took it seriously until that year when six students and ten parents from that cursed Class 3 died. Koichi now understood the cause and effect of the situation, but he was still puzzled. Why would death occur if there was an extra person appearing in the class? Misaki said she didn't know either, only that this extra person was actually a deceased person, who was somehow revived from the death and wasn't a typical ghost. They were indistinguishable from living people. They had emotions and memories, but they didn't know they were dead. These people were all individuals who had previously died due to this phenomenon. So to avoid the curse, the class three tried many countermeasures, changing names, changing classrooms, exorcisms, but nothing worked. However, a decade ago, someone figured out how to avoid the disaster by ignoring the extra person, treating them as if they didn't exist. This way, the total number of people in the class would return to normal, and they could safely break the curse or spell. In the beginning, Misaki, due to a random draw, was reluctantly chosen as the non-existent person for this year. In the evening, Koichi and Misaki were walking home together. Koichi was incredibly curious, asking if it was really worth it to be treated as a non-existent person for the sake of a so-called curse. Misaki responded that she didn't know. She just happened to be the one chosen, and everyone would have to treat the chosen one as if they didn't exist. They arrived at a park. Koichi wondered why he also had to be treated as non-existent. Misaki explained that it was probably to strengthen the effect of the curse, because Koichi seemed unwilling to follow their rules and kept contacting Misaki, their chosen non-existent person. Still, if it really worked, it would be a good thing because the sadness from accidental deaths was too much to bear. Under the moonlight, Misaki once again removed her eye patch. She explained that she lost her left eye to a malignant tumor when she was four years old. However, because ordinary prosthetic eyes were too ugly, her mother made a fake one for her. Koichi felt that her eye was pretty, and there was no need to cover it with an eye patch. Misaki told Koichi that she almost died during her surgery, and she clearly remembered how it felt. Death was not gentle at all. Misaki reached out her hand to Koichi because from that moment on, they became the same kind of people. They shook hands, indicating that they would support each other from then on. During the exam the next day, Koichi was a bit distracted. Suddenly he stood up, and Misaki also stood up. Just like that, they danced joyfully under the gaze of everyone who ignored them. However, everything that just happened was merely Koichi's fantasy. At noon, they went to the rooftop to have lunch together. After Koichi discovered that Misaki only ate vegetarian food, he promised her that he would let her taste his cooking if they had the chance. They also made a pact to visit an art exhibition in Tokyo together. Just like that, they skipped classes together, chatted after school, and went to the park. Their days were quite interesting. One day, Misaki took Koichi to the art club for a visit. The students there greeted them warmly, but suddenly Yuya ran in and ushered everyone out. Following this, the two of them went to the school library. Koichi showed Misaki a photo of his mother from back in the day. The librarian didn't ignore them, which was unusual. The librarian was the exact homeroom teacher of class 3 26 years ago. Koichi was puzzled because he seemed to ignore them in some way. 
Surprisingly, the librarian expressed that he currently had no relation to the class. Koichi asked for an explanation, to which the librarian explained that only the people of Class 3 and their blood relatives within two generations were cursed, and the curse only applied within Yomiyama, much like the range of a mobile phone signal. Koichi was still curious. Given this, why didn't the librarian simply move out of Yomiyama? The librarian explained that since he had opened the door of death himself, he had a responsibility, and that's why he chose to stay in the school. However, he admitted that half of him was running away, and the other half was filled with guilt. After this, the librarian handed them a register with records about Class 3 over the many years, which included not only everyone's names, but also marked those who died young. The librarian explained that after a death occurs, it's only on graduation day that the person completely disappears, and all the register records revert to their original state. Even people's memories are restored and altered. Up to the present, the only known effective method against this curse is to create a non-existent person, to balance out the extra person that appears each year. However, this method only has a success rate of 50%, and the curse has never unexpectedly stopped in the middle of the year. Just then, the class bell rang, and the librarian escorted the two to the door, indicating that their conversation had come to an end for the day. Upon returning home that night, Koichi told his grandparents and aunt about what had happened. His grandparents could only express their regret and sadness. His aunt, Mikami, who was also a student of Class 3 back in the day, stated that the incident had once stopped halfway through, seemingly during the summer vacation of that year when they did something. However, when Koichi pressed for more details, his aunt was in considerable pain. No matter how hard she tried, she couldn't remember, and this effort was accompanied by a severe headache. The next day, the class teacher arrived with a large black package. Everyone noticed his mental state seemed abnormal and his words were disjointed and nonsensical. Suddenly, he pulled out a chilling dagger from the package. As the teacher's mental state deteriorated, he brandished the dagger in the air and, to everyone's horror, plunged it into his own throat. It seemed as if he feared he wouldn't die. He yanked it out, and blood spurted out wildly. The red fluid splashed all over everyone in the classroom. In the horrified gaze of everyone, the teacher slowly fell to the ground, a pool of bright red blood flowing out from under him, blooming like a grotesque red flower. Finally, the students reacted. Chicken screams and goose pushing ensued. Some frantically fled the hellish classroom, while others were paralyzed with fear. Koichi, as if possessed, moved towards the teacher. Just then, the librarian arrived and began to evacuate the remaining students. Shortly after, teacher Mikami also arrived, but stood fearfully at the classroom door, unable to approach. It wasn't until the librarian urged her to call the police that she snapped out of her daze and ran to get help. However, Misaki remained eerily calm in the face of such a horrific incident. It seemed that even increasing the number of non-existent people to two had no effect. When Koichi and Misaki left the classroom together, they were surprised to find their classmates looking at them with complex expressions. Later, the librarian recalled that the class teacher indeed seemed out of sorts today. When the librarian encountered him in the morning, the teacher's mental state was poor, and he was muttering to himself that he couldn't bear it anymore and didn't know how to continue. The teacher also said that he felt the librarian would understand his actions and indicated he had a favor to ask of him. Subsequently, the librarian explained the current situation to Koichi and Misaki. According to the police investigation at the teacher's residence, they found that he had been single all along and had a seriously ill mother at home. The exhaustion from taking care of his mother over many years, coupled with the curse of Class 3, had left him under great pressure. He had chosen to end his own life after killing his mother. The librarian believed that the teacher was also drawn into this unstoppable tragedy due to the curse of Class 3, and died in this irrational manner. What's more, there would be ongoing deaths. Shortly after, Naoya found Koichi and Misaki on the rooftop. He apologized to them for everything that had happened. Given the current situation, the strategy of the non-existent person was no longer working, so there was no need to continue. During their conversation, Izumi also arrived at the rooftop and expressed her apologies to them. However, this curse was far from over. Koichi was somewhat curious about whether some classmates would disappear after the summer vacation. Misaki suggested that some people might already be starting to flee, as every year people take advantage of the summer vacation to escape from Yomiyama. Naoya joked about Misaki's casual attitude, suggesting maybe she was the one who would disappear next. Misaki didn't react, but instead asked Naoya if he had ever considered that he might be the one. This caught Naoya off guard. He said he had no impression of dying and remembered everything about his childhood. His flustered response prompted laughter from everyone. 
In the afternoon, Koichi and Misaki visited the library again to find the librarian. They had heard that the curse had ceased midway during the year when Koichi's mother was in school. The librarian pulled out a record from a drawer, explaining that it was the only time in 25 years that the curse had once stopped midway. From the information he had, seven people died that year. The last two deaths occurred on August 9th, and after that day, the curse for that year stopped in August. However, they were unable to determine who the non-existent person was that year. Koichi immediately asked if the students of Class 3 had done something over the summer vacation to stop the curse. The librarian thought for a moment and said he didn't remember what everyone had done, but they had a training camp on August 8th that year, during which they visited the local shrine in Yomiyama. It's a very old temple located halfway up the mountain. Although they had visited the temple again later, the curse remained and no miracles happened. The librarian said they still don't know the real reason the curse stopped that year. However, teacher Mikami had found him earlier and proposed to organize another training camp and visit that temple for worship. Walking alone in the school building, Koichi saw the blood-red scenery outside the window. Suddenly, Misaki, Izumi, Naoya, and Yuya all appeared behind him, asking who the non-existent person was. All the classmates were looking at him, beginning to melt into a scarlet hue. What frightened Koichi more was that he began to decay. When he woke up from the nightmare, he received a phone call from his father in distant India. His father was still as enthusiastic as ever. Koichi asked his father if he had ever seen a photo of his mother from her middle school years because he heard there was a supposedly haunted photo. His father said that although he had seen his mother's album when they got married, he hadn't seen any haunted photos. He vaguely remembered her mentioning it, but since she didn't want to keep it, the photo was left in their old house. Faced with Koichi's strange question, his father asked with some concern if his son had encountered any problems. However, Koichi said there was no issue, he was just curious. Koichi then pretended the signal was bad and hung up. Afterwards, Koichi received a call from Naoya, who invited him to meet at a cafe. Izumi and Yuya were also there. Yuya explained that he felt this matter might involve his older sister, who also graduated from the same middle school and knew a particularly secretive piece of information. At this point, Yuya's sister joined them to share her story. She explained that they had a regular customer at their store named Katsumi, who was also a student of Class 3 at the middle school. Unable to contain her curiosity, she asked the man about his experience. After finishing his drink in one gulp, Katsumi set down his glass and murmured that he stopped the curse that year and saved everyone. He thought he must tell the future generations. Naoya asked what he meant by stopped, but Yuya's sister explained that Katsumi claimed to not remember anything afterwards, no matter how much she probed. Izumi then speculated that this Katsumi must know something and must have done something. Koichi then went to Misaki's house to invite her to find Katsumi together, but she declined. Her father was coming back, and they were planning to go on a holiday out of town, an event she couldn't refuse. Moreover, she had to rush back to join the training camp. Koichi changed the topic and noted that a doll in Misaki's house bore a strong resemblance to her. Misaki told him that the doll was a representation of her mother's child from 12 years ago, who died shortly after birth. The doll was made by her mother over the years as a way to remember the deceased child. Misaki was only a part of it, perhaps less than half. After saying this, Misaki handed Koichi a note with her phone number and turned to leave. When Koichi caught up with her, he found her lying in the doll cabinet. Misaki suddenly opened her eyes. She reassured Koichi, telling him she knew he wasn't the extra person. That evening, Koichi returned home and asked his aunt about Katsumi and what he had done in the past. However, while his aunt remembered doing something during the training camp all those years ago, she now couldn't recall any specifics. Nevertheless, she promised to contact Katsumi for them and accompany them to meet him. Soon, the day to meet Katsumi arrived. Everyone packed their things and set off, but the trip was eerily silent. On the car ride, Koichi curiously asked Izumi how she became the leader of the countermeasure group. Izumi explained that typically no one wanted to take on that role, so it was usually appointed by the homeroom teacher. However, she volunteered for it because she believed in the curse and couldn't stand its irrationality. She wanted to stand up and stop it. It's finally their new training camp day. Upon arriving at the beach, everyone was excited and rushed towards the sand and waves. Here, they all enjoyed a long-awaited relaxation. After eating some cold watermelon, they played freely by the rolling seaside. To Koichi's surprise, Misaki, who was on vacation with her family, was also there. 
After their frolicking, everyone was feeling hungry. Naoya pulled out some camping cooking equipment from their luggage, while Mikami bought a large amount of meat and vegetables. After enjoying a hearty barbecue meal, everyone, now full and satisfied, played volleyball on the beach. Katsumi arrived just at this time, exchanging banter with Mikami. Suddenly, a strong gust of wind blew across the beach, lifting the volleyball high into the air and into the sea. Their classmate Nakao quickly jumped into the water to retrieve it, alarming everyone to rush to the edge of the beach to check. Seeing that he was unharmed, the group all breathed a sigh of relief. However, a speedboat suddenly sped towards them from a distance. As expected, the rotating propeller tore everything apart and a wave of red spread in the sea. Accompanied by the waves, the corpse was hurled out. Everyone fell into a terrified silence. Koichi suddenly heard a murmur from behind him. Whirling around, he found Katsumi whispering something, saying he was the one who saved them, and he left that thing in the classroom. After everyone had attended the funeral of their classmate, Koichi and Misaki went home with the librarian and teacher Mikami. The librarian asked the two how Nakao had been on the day of the incident and whether there were any abnormalities. Koichi said that Nakao had been a little carsick that day, but didn't show any other strange behavior. But Misaki added that Nakao seemed unable to swim in a straight line that day. Knowing that, the librarian explained to them that according to the coroner's examination, Nakao had already died before being hit by the speedboat. The brain hemorrhage caused by the speedboat collision was too far from normal. Also, according to testimony from Nakao's family, they seemed to hear a loud noise near the staircase before leaving that day. When they rushed to check, they only saw their son rushing out of the house. Misaki analyzed this, indicating that Nakao had already been injured at that time, and the incident had happened within the boundaries of Yomiyama. Koichi found it hard to accept this outcome. He and Misaki sat in the park together. It seemed like he wanted to say something, but eventually chose not to. Late at night within Yomiyama Middle School, Koichi walked up to the school building. Sakura, holding a blood umbrella, suddenly appeared in front of him, saying, It's all his fault. Then the bloody teacher also appeared in front of him, saying, It's all his fault. In a panic, he opened the classroom door, and Nurse Mizuno and Nakao both burst out, accusing him of the same. Koichi woke up once again from the nightmare. He could no longer remember how many times he had had this bad dream. The next day, Koichi found Naoya and Yuya. He told them about the murmuring he had heard from Katsumi that day. However, when faced with their questions, he didn't know what the man had hidden in that classroom, but at least they had a clue now. Naoya took out his phone ready to contact everyone, but was stopped by Koichi. He wasn't ready to tell others. No one else should lose their life because of this curse. So for the time being, it was better not to tell the members of the countermeasure group. They would ask for their help when they truly needed it. Thus, the three agreed to meet at 3 p.m. the next day and go to the old classroom of Class 3 to look for clues. The next day, the sky was overcast, as if a storm was about to break at any moment. Naoya and Koichi arrived at the school as agreed, but unexpectedly, they ran into Ayano, who was participating in school activities. Under her questioning, they had to admit that they came to school to search for clues to break the curse, but Naoya invited them to join. However, Ayano and Yumi declined his invitation and left without looking back. When Koichi and Naoya arrived at the agreed-upon art classroom, Yuya was nowhere in sight. Instead, they saw Misaki, who had just arrived and was preparing to paint. Just as Misaki asked why they were at school during the summer vacation, Yuya finally hurried over. Faced with their strange reactions, Misaki said she also wanted to join and was the first to cross the sign that read, No Entry. As the pitter-patter of rain fell outside, the four of them reached the door of what was once Class 3. Upon opening the classroom door, they found it damp and cluttered with junk, even lacking lights. While they rummaged around, Koichi asked Naoya whether he believed in ghosts or supernatural phenomena. But Naoya said he didn't believe in such things, suggesting that such occurrences are probably just misinterpretations by people. Yuya mentioned a secret about the library. It was said that moans could often be heard from a room inside the library. Rumor had it that there was a secret book room underground where some confidential documents were kept. To protect these documents, a librarian was supposedly locked inside. However, Naoya and Koichi didn't believe it and even mocked the idea. Who would live underground until now? Suddenly, Misaki said that she had clearly heard the moaning sound. Everyone was shocked, but she quickly added she was just kidding. 
Misaki then complained about the stuffy room and wanted to open a window for fresh air. However, the glass shattered unexpectedly. Koichi noticed in time and pulled Misaki away. Without more delay, everyone continued their search. Suddenly, Misaki accidentally stepped on a rotten piece of flooring. In her panic, she knocked over a large storage cabinet that fell onto Naoya, who couldn't dodge in time. Fortunately, Naoya was unharmed. The group resumed their search, but they couldn't find what they were after. Just as they became frustrated, Misaki pointed to a corner, suggesting that what they were looking for might be there. Sure enough, after Koichi inspected the area, he found a parcel on top of a cabinet. He brought it down with some confusion. Misaki indicated that there seemed to be a message written on the parcel. For future generations who will suffer in this class from the disaster, everyone thought it must be the thing that Katsumi left behind. Koichi unwrapped the parcel only to find a cassette tape inside. The group moved to the projection room, and Katsumi's recording emanated from the tape player, saying that he was a student from Class 3 who also experienced a terrifying curse that year, and he was making this recording to provide a solution to the curse. He spoke of an extra person infiltrating the class, which he had identified. Not long ago, everyone went to visit an ancient temple, full of hope that the curse would be resolved. But on their return, the previously clear weather turned stormy. One of the boys was smug about having brought an umbrella, but the next moment, Moment, a bolt of lightning struck him dead. Chaos ensued, and a girl fell off a cliff to her death. After everyone descended the mountain, that incident happened. Just at this crucial moment, the recording abruptly stopped. Outside the room, the sound of the school security patrolling could be heard. The group quickly removed the tape and hid it, waiting for the security to leave. They wanted to continue listening, but they found that the tape had been damaged in the chaos. With no other option, they had to give the tape to Yuya for repair. On the other side, the Ayano family was driving on the road. They planned to take advantage of the summer vacation to flee to another place, away from the cursed village. However, as the family rounded a corner, a rock rolled down the mountain and hit their car, causing it to lose control and tumble down the hillside. When Yumi returned home, she found that a construction vehicle had crashed into her house, killing her brother who was playing video games at the time. Time moved forward to the day of the training camp. However, everyone standing outside the hotel had a worried expression. Even when taking a group photo, not a single person could muster a smile. Afterward, everyone agreed to visit the temple the next day to pray for safety. Then, Naoya and Koichi met up again with the other two because Yuya had repaired the cassette tape. When they sat down in the room and Naoya pressed the play button, Katsumi's voice came out again, saying after coming down the mountain he got into a fight with a stranger, and during the course, he accidentally pushed him and killed him. He was terrified and ran back to the dormitory of the training camp. But no matter who he asked, no one remembered this stranger. They all swore that there were only 21 people in their group. So he concluded that the stranger was the extra person, and he had killed him. That's how he was sure that if the extra person was killed, the curse would stop. By this point, the four of them understood the cause and effect of the events. But the problem was that the extra person was just like everyone else, with no distinguishing features or differences, making him impossible to identify. Even if they knew who this person was, could they really kill their classmate? That night, everyone gathered in the dining room. Koichi and his group discussed how they could identify the extra person. Just then, Izumi stated that the tragedies that started in May were still ongoing. She admitted that this was a failure on her part as the leader of the countermeasure group. She wanted to apologize to everyone. Everyone was unsure if there would be any change during the training camp, but she felt that Misaki had some responsibility for this. Izumi seemed a bit conflicted, but stated that if Misaki had followed the agreement to fully play the role of a non-existent person, there wouldn't have been any deaths. But Naoya argued that it wasn't fair to put it that way, because there were uncontrollable factors involved. However, Izumi felt that if Misaki had firmly played the non-existent role, and adamantly refused to interact with Koichi, their plan could have succeeded. So she thought the failure was mainly Misaki's responsibility. Naoya asked her what she wanted to do, and Izumi said that she needed an apology. Until now, no one had received an apology. However, Misaki stated that all of this was meaningless. Even if she apologized, it wouldn't stop the curse. But after a brief silence, Misaki turned to Izumi and bowed deeply, apologizing. This infuriated Yuya and the others, because they knew that the root cause was not Misaki. Just as Naoya was about to reveal the truth, a sudden commotion ensued. It turns out a classmate suddenly had an asthma attack and collapsed on the table, but his medication was ineffective. Everyone's phones had no signal, making it impossible to call for help. In desperation, the librarian decided to take his car and bring the classmate down the mountain to seek medical treatment. 
Not long after the two left, Misaki invited Koichi to her room. She was curious about the paranormal photo of Koichi's mother. Before the training camp, Koichi had found the photo. Looking at his mother's picture, Koichi told Misaki the whole story behind it. Then Misaki shared with Koichi that the cousin she was going to see when they first met was actually her twin sister. However, because of economic reasons, the sister was sent for adoption to another family since she was born. Although she had never met her biological parents, it didn't hinder her close relationship with Misaki. The twin sister was once a member of Class 3. Then, in May of this year, she was taken away by an asthma attack. Since then, everyone believed that the curse began in May. After that, Misaki told Koichi about her left eye, which could see things that were invisible to others, the color of death. It was an indistinguishable color that appeared only on the dead or those about to die. In other words, she could see who was nearing death. Although she knew Koichi might not believe such absurd things, it was indeed a secret she had buried deep in her heart, and she never mentioned it to even her sister. It's why she decided to cover up her eye. It also explained why she wanted to see those photos from the past. Koichi asked if there was an aura of death on the mountain. Misaki confirmed his question, saying from the first time she saw it, it was clearly evident. However, she couldn't see any color of death on Koichi, so she was sure he was not the extra person. Misaki then explained that this was why she wore an eye patch at school, because even if she knew who was about to die, there was nothing she could do about it. Koichi wondered if the extra person had come to the camp this time. A thunderclap lit up the whole room, indicating that it's here. Just as Koichi was about to ask another question, another thunderclap sounded in the sky. Naoya burst into the room saying he might have killed someone. He excitedly asked Misaki and Koichi if they knew a classmate named Kazami. This left them baffled. Kazami was their former class president, of course they knew him. Upon receiving their affirmative answer, Naoya slumped to the floor. He murmured to himself that it's all over and he had made a deadly mistake. Seeing Naoya's inexplicable reaction, Koichi and Misaki were at a loss. After a while, Naoya started to explain. It turns out he had long suspected that Kazami was the extra person. When he had gone to test this theory, Kazami seemed to have no memory of their childhood. In his desperation, Naoya had concluded that Kazami was the extra person. Kazami had become furious when questioned, so Naoya thought that if he killed him, not only would the curse be lifted, but no one would remember this person or this incident. Misaki and Koichi were stunned, unable to believe that Naoya had actually attempted to kill someone. Naoya, terrified, fell to his knees and explained that he hadn't actually wanted to kill Kazami. It was just that after they fought on the balcony, he turned around to find Kazami had fallen off and was lying motionless on the ground. Seeing Koichi going into Misaki's room, he rushed over to confirm whether everyone still remembered Kazami. If Kazami was the extra person, all evidence of his existence would disappear. Koichi tried to comfort Naoya, suggesting that he might be mistaken and Kazami might not be dead. After all, a fall from a two-story building wouldn't necessarily kill someone. Immediately after, the three decided to head to the garden together to find Kazami. While passing through the lobby, Koichi noticed the cafeteria door was ajar, which struck him as odd. He left the group to check it out, and suddenly a bloody hand reached out from the darkness, grabbing him. After a closer look, he realized it was a classmate. Koichi rushed to the cafeteria entrance to find it ablaze, and the manager was pinned inside. In panic, he helped this classmate up, intending to flee. At this point, Misaki and Naoya returned from the garden without having found Kazami. Coincidentally, Izumi was passing by. Koichi quickly briefed her on the situation, suspecting a murderer and arsonist was hiding in the hostel. Izumi pressed an emergency alarm, but it failed to sound, clearly having been sabotaged. Suddenly, the screams of their classmate, Takako, echoed from upstairs. Everyone else rushed upstairs. By the time they arrived, they found a large patch of blood on the door, and the room inside looked like a scene from hell, covered in blood. Yuya arrived, and Koichi quickly asked him if he had seen Takako and Kazami. Unexpectedly, Yuya mentioned that Kazami had returned mud-covered and furious, saying that Naoya was behaving suspiciously. Yuya had then shared the contents of a tape with him. Koichi rushed to Kazami and Yuya's room, but Kazami was nowhere to be found, and even the tape recorder on the table was gone. Koichi instructed everyone to split up and search for Kazami, while also notifying all classmates to evacuate the apartment to avoid unnecessary harm. Upon hearing this, Yuya expressed his intention to inform their teacher, Mikami. However, when they reached Teacher Mikami's room, it was empty save for a pool of blood nearby. Naoya wanted to call the police, but Yuya insisted on verifying the teacher's safety first. 
Following the trail of blood, they found another room. Upon opening the door, the room was pitch black. Suddenly, a flash of lightning illuminated the room, revealing a blood-soaked murderer holding a terrifyingly sharp knife. Upon seeing Yuya and Naoya, the murderer immediately lunged at them, swinging the knife towards a fallen Naoya. Fortunately, the knife embedded itself in the wall behind Naoya. Seeing this, Yuya tackled the murderer, intending to help Naoya escape, but found that Naoya's leg had been injured and he couldn't move. Downstairs, Koichi and his companions heard the screams of Naoya. Just as they prepared to investigate, a flurry of footsteps interrupted them. The person arriving was Takako, who pulled out a chilling kitchen knife, intending to attack Masaki. She claimed the extra person was revived from death and shouted the dead should be returned to death. But Koichi quickly tackled Takako and seized the knife. Takako then walked away as if nothing had happened. It was only then that Izumi told Koichi that Takako had listened to the tape. It turns out, Takako had encountered them while they were looking for clues, and Yumi had later informed them about it. From then on, Takako started behaving strangely. Suddenly, a voice echoed from the apartment's PA system. It was Takako announcing that she was going to play a recording. As expected, the recording was indeed from the tape. As all the bloody truths were revealed, everyone was stunned. At the end of the broadcast, Takako shockingly claimed that the extra person was Misaki. She stated that they were classmates during their childhood when Misaki still had both eyes, which she believed was evidence of Misaki's incomplete resurrection. So now she urged everyone to kill Misaki because she was the extra person. Everyone left their rooms mumbling, let the dead return to death, and started pressuring Misaki and Koichi with weapons in hand. Fortunately, Teacher Mikami appeared in time to stop them. However, facing the threat of death, one of the male students knocked the teacher down. Having no other choice, Koichi took Misaki's hand and they fled their shitty life desperately. Even if they managed to escape into a room, they couldn't stop their terrified classmates. Among them, Yumi, driven mad by her brother's death due to the construction vehicle crash, chased Misaki to the window with a dagger. But she slipped, fell out of the window, and died on impact. Koichi and Misaki quickly escaped to the staircase. At this point, a gas leak caused by the fire in the cafeteria ignited, and a fierce tongue of flame engulfed another student. Just when Koichi and Misaki thought they were safe in the stairwell, Takako suddenly appeared behind them and stabbed Koichi. Despite this, Takako, who had retained a sliver of sanity, only beat Koichi before turning to attack Misaki. But in the nick of time, she was caught by a loose electric wire around her neck. In the ensuing chaos, the corridor collapsed again, leaving her hanging high. She struggled for a bit but suffocated to death. At this moment, Izumi also rushed over from the lower passage, just in time to see Takako hanging in the air. She also saw the kitchen knife in Misaki's hand. No matter how Koichi tried to explain, she was no longer willing to listen. She swore she would kill Misaki to avenge Takako. Suddenly, Misaki turned around and ran inexplicably. Koichi wanted to chase her, but another collapse in the corridor blocked him. By this time, the fire in the apartment had spread everywhere, and everyone began to react and frantically flee. A group of four just escaped to the lobby of the apartment building when a huge chandelier fell from the sky. There were even murders caused by mutual suspicion among the students. On the other hand, Yuya was helping Naoya to flee desperately. After he got Naoya to the window, he also prepared to escape by climbing out. But just as he was about to succeed, the murderer caught up. Just as he was about to be captured, Naoya exerted all his strength to struggle with the murderer, causing the murderer to be dragged out of the window. Just as he was about to finish off Naoya with a dagger, a hand suddenly appeared to stop him. It was the librarian who easily threw the murderer aside and resolved the situation. But the fire in the apartment was completely out of control. Everyone was scrambling to escape, but accidents were happening everywhere. Some were hit by falling chandeliers, some were trapped in the fire. Koichi walked inside the burning building, which was not only full of fire, but also the bodies of his classmates. Just then, a classmate ran from a distance to ask him for help. But in the next second, a dagger flew into the back of her neck. After she slumped to the ground, it was revealed that it was Kazami who had done it. Kazami calmly removed the dagger, wiped the blood off his glasses, and calmly stated that although Takako said Misaki was the one, he believed that Koichi was the true extra person. After saying this, he madly brandished his dagger trying to kill Koichi. No matter how Koichi tried to explain, Kazami wouldn't listen at all. In the fight between the two, the injured Koichi was easily knocked down. Kazami said since he was almost killed by Naoya, he understood that if the extra person did not return to death, death would be his own. 
Kazami expressed his madness, saying if only Koichi had not approached the chosen non-existent person at the very beginning, everything would have been fine. Just as he was about to finish off Koichi, Kazami suddenly froze, then fell forward. The person who came for rescue was Izumi. She felt that Kazami had already killed two classmates, and it was unnecessary for him to continue living. As she prepared to swing her stick to kill Kazami, the librarian appeared in time to stop her. Facing the librarian's argument that classmates should not kill each other, Izumi was dismissive. She thought the librarian, who was afraid of death and chose to be a bystander, was not qualified to say this. After saying this, Izumi ran away alone. After Koichi and the librarian moved Kazami outside, Koichi once again entered the burning building. Flames raged throughout the apartment complex, consuming every corridor and stairwell. Suddenly, in the hallway, Koichi saw Izumi and Misaki in a standoff. He rushed over, hoping to stop Izumi, but she was not listening. She pushed Koichi to the ground and turned to attack Misaki with a knife. After a fierce struggle, Izumi managed to get Misaki under control. Just as she was about to deliver the fatal blow, Koichi knocked her aside and tried to explain to her. But Izumi, after a moment of silence, erupted again, knocking Koichi down. She couldn't understand why she wanted to protect everyone so much, but since Koichi also wanted to die, she decided to kill him too. Suddenly, a massive bolt of lightning struck the apartment complex. All the glass windows shattered simultaneously, and when Koichi looked up again, he was utterly shocked. Izumi had collapsed onto the floor, her body riddled with shards of glass. Koichi removed the glass and cradled Izumi in his arms. It was then that Izumi voiced her long-held wish. But in the next second, another explosion caused the apartment to collapse. Koichi turned around, only to find that he couldn't locate Misaki. With hope, he dialed her number, and luckily she picked up quickly. Misaki was in the backyard, and Koichi told her to stay put while he rushed to find her. But Misaki told him not to come. She would handle the tragedy herself. When Koichi arrived in the backyard, he saw Misaki with a pickaxe. Before her were two logs, and under them laid a person. Koichi wanted to rescue the person, but Misaki refused, saying that the person was marked by death. As Misaki prepared to kill the person with the pickaxe, the person slowly crawled out. When Koichi saw the person's face, he was stunned. It was actually his aunt, Teacher Mikami, who had crawled out from under the pile of wood. Memories flooded Koichi's mind. He remembered when his aunt had asked him to abide by all the rules and regulations in class and to keep personal matters separate from school, always addressing her as Teacher Mikami, not his aunt. Misaki explained that this year's Class 3 was not missing any desk sets, and the entire school had only one additional assistant teacher in Class 3. Although the classroom was indeed short of a set of desks and chairs, it had appeared in Teacher Mikami's office, finally revealing that Teacher Mikami was the extra person, the revived dead. Misaki asked Koichi to leave while she dealt with the curse, but he stopped her after all, this was his aunt. In the end, Koichi chose to take the pickaxe from Misaki's hand. Facing his pleading aunt, he hesitated. Remembering the past, he didn't know whether to believe Misaki. If Misaki was lying, then he would have killed his own aunt. In the end, Koichi chose to believe Misaki, and with the pickaxe raised high, he brought it down. Afterwards, Koichi, who still retained his memories, visited the Yomiyama Cemetery with Misaki to pay their respects to his aunt. Now, Koichi thoroughly recalled everything. His aunt Mikami had been killed in an accident a year and a half ago, but aside from him and Misaki, no one else seemed to remember anything about her. On the way home, Koichi cheerfully asked Misaki if everything should be over now. Misaki didn't respond, but simply returned a calm, quiet smile. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.